How the heck does that work? Hey crazies, I'm adding a new video into the mix where I explain how things work. Today, we're covering the Crooks Radiometer. What's a Crooks Radiometer? Great question! It was invented by an English chemist and physicist named William Crooks. A chemist and a physicist? Wow, that doesn't happen a lot these days. Anyway, a Crooks Radiometer looks something like this. There are four veins, each with a white side and a black side. They're enclosed in an airtight glass ball where most of the air has been sucked out. When you shine light on it, the veins spin. Simple enough to demonstrate, but a huge pain to explain. There are three effects at play. Pressure from light, also known as radiation pressure, pressure from heated air, and air vortices. Let's look at those one at a time. Option one, radiation pressure. When atoms run into each other, they exchange momentum. If there are a lot of atoms, we call that pressure. Radiation is just a catch-all word for particles that carry energy away. Any type of light counts as radiation. Photons have momentum too, which they can also give to atoms after hitting them. If there are a lot of photons, we call that radiation pressure. In the radiometer, the photons hit the white side twice as hard as the black side, which gives us a net force in this direction. There's a slight problem though. The momentum of a single photon is proportional to its energy, and therefore its frequency. That is a seriously tiny number. When you consider the dimensions of a radiometer vein, the type of, strength of, and distance to your light source, and finally multiplied by four, you get 2.5 nanonewtons. That's itty bitty. So while radiation pressure makes solar sails possible and balances the inward gravity of a star, those things are big. To get the tiny veins in the radiometer to respond, you'd have to vent all the air to space and shut off gravity to minimize friction. Physics land. I really gotta figure out where that's coming from. Anyway, I can do all of these things because I'm on a spaceship, but you can't, and the company that makes these certainly can't either. We know there's more going on here for multiple reasons. If radiation pressure was it, it would spin this way, but a standard radiometer spins the other way. It doesn't even need to be light. Just getting it hot or cold will make it spin. Keep in mind, scientists have been discussing this thing for over a century now. It started in the late 1800s between Maxwell and Reynolds. They kept publishing papers as rebuttals to each other, but then Maxwell died and the Royal Society wouldn't let Reynolds respond anymore. After that, no progress was made for almost 40 years because we just didn't have the technology to verify anything. Option two, pressure from heated air. A standard Crookes radiometer does have air. Only a little bit, but it's there. The air gets heated near the veins, but more so on the black side. The temperature increase causes a pressure increase, and that pressure pushes the veins forward. Is it really that simple? <laughs> no. This is the science asylum. You think we're gonna stay that superficial? Temperature increases and pressure increases don't always correlate. We need to consider something called the mean free path. That's the average distance a molecule can travel before you expect it to run into another molecule. If the air is really thin, that could be the size of the veins in the radiometer. But since the air molecules in the radiometer also hit the veins, the pressure isn't evenly distributed across those veins. Ricocheting molecules can keep other molecules from hitting the vein. That happens more near the center than the edge. So the pressure across the vein looks more like this. It's higher near the edges and less near the center. However, the more molecules there are in the glass bulb, the smaller the mean free path. That does mean the pressure can distribute across the veins better, but too many and it will distribute throughout the whole radiometer better, resulting in effectively zero pressure difference on the veins. Option three, air vortices. Even when there isn't a pressure difference moving the veins along, the temperature difference is still there. With more air molecules around, that temperature difference pushes the air like this. And by Newton's third law, the veins are pushed in the opposite direction. The radiometer veins still spin. But as we mentioned before, the more air molecules there are in the glass bulb, the smaller the mean free path. If you put too many molecules in there, they hit each other so much, their motion becomes random again. That's why this doesn't work at atmospheric pressure. So which is it? Option two or option three? Both. Manufacturers of these things have found a sweet spot at about one pascal. That's about 10 millionths of an atmosphere, so pretty low. But it's just the right number of air molecules so that a pressure difference and an airflow are both at play inside the radiometer. Complicated.
So crazies, what do you think? Do you want to see more of this type of video? Have you ever wondered how something worked? Let us know in the comments. Thanks for liking and sharing this video. Don't forget to subscribe if you'd like to keep up with us. And until next time, remember, it's okay to be a little crazy. The featured comment comes from Rodney Smith, who asked, Does using a magnet make it weaker? Yep. The energy to do that work has to come from somewhere. The result is that a truly permanent magnet is impossible.